Hey guys, welcome to Relatable. Happy Thursday. This episode is brought to you by our friends at Good Ranchers. Go to goodranchers.com slash Allie. That's goodranchers.com slash Allie. All right, I've got a really fun conversation for you today with two guests, Delano Squires. You've seen him on Relatable before, and also uh, Shamika Michelle. She is a contributor for uh, Jason Whitlock's Fearless. She has amazing commentary and amazing insight. We are going to talk about the issues specific to Black America, how we as Christians should be approaching them with both truth and in love, but we're also going to talk talk about this issue of abortion and how the media is framing it and really how the media tries to conflate LGBTQ issues, abortion issues with so-called racial justice. And we'll also kind of critique a little bit of how the church is responding so timidly to all of these things. You're going to love this conversation. Wait till the end where they just, they will give you so much fire. You will leave this conversation feeling really inspired. I'm excited for you to hear it. So without further ado, here are our new friends, Delano and Shamika. Thank you guys so much for joining me, Delano. This is, I believe, your second time on the show. This is your first time on the show. So can you first tell us who you are and what you do? I am Shamika Michelle, and I'm a contributor for Fearless with the Blaze. Mm -hmm. So thank you for having me, Allie. I appreciate it. of course. And Delano, you are a contributor as well for Jason. Correct. Okay, so today we're going to talk about um, quite a few things. I just want to get both of your reactions to them and just respond in whatever order you guys want. So we were talking before the uh, before the camera started rolling about this $40 billion that has been secured for Ukraine, Ukrainian defenses. And Mitch McConnell, who is a Republican senator, he said a couple days ago that we all agree, he said in a press conference, we all agree that this is the most important thing going on in the world. Mm. Well, I don't think any of us deny that it's important, or I don't think any of us have a lack of compassion for the Ukrainian people, absolutely. But there's a lot that's going on that is affecting our daily lives. I don't know. Hmm. What do you guys think? Do you think like that what's going on in Ukraine is the most important thing in your lives or what's going on in the world right now? Yeah, I don't agree. When I'm at the gas pump, I don't agree. <laughs> when I am at the grocery store and my bill is higher than usual, I don't agree. And I think Mitch McConnell and so many others are so out of touch with the common person that they say ridiculous things like this, not realizing the strain that everyday people feel. Mm-hmm. So, no, I definitely don't think it's the most important, not to me and not to many people that I know. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, I feel the same way. I mean, as Shamika said, I see gas prices creeping back up. Um, but, but I think the comments from Mitch McConnell reveal sort of what some people will call the, the uniparty, mm-hmm. uh, which is that Democrats and Republicans, uh, when it comes to certain issues and war is one of them, seem to be more on the same page with each other than they are with the American public. So um, that, that, the notion that the most important thing for U.S. senators to be focusing on is uh, maintaining the sovereignty of Ukraine as opposed to addressing the issues in America right. is, is one of the reasons that both groups get called globalists. And, mm-hmm. I, and I think that label is, is fitting and appropriate. Yeah, especially when you are considering the fact that our own country's borders are not being protected. Correct. Our own sovereignty is not being protected. Our own democratic processes mm-hmm. are not being protected by the very same people who say that the number one priority of American politicians mm-hmm. is to represent the interests of Ukraine. I mean, just a few things that are going on. Obviously, you mentioned high gas prices, inflation that is affecting all kinds of goods and services, the border wide open. We've got a fentanyl opioid homelessness crisis in many American cities. I mean, look at the American towns, especially in the Rust Belt. They're completely gutted because both parties have really kind of outsourced our manufacturing, outsourced our jobs. People are struggling and suffering there. Murder is up in major cities. Suicide is up among young people, I think in large part due to a lot of the 
policies that forced young people into isolation for the past two years. And then thinking of democracy and liberty, the DHS has a disinformation <laughs> board. The DOJ is going after concerned parents right. that are complaining to school boards. The House Judiciary Committee confirmed yesterday people can't find baby formula, literally cannot feed their babies here, mm -hmm. here in the United States. This is happening to the constituents of the people who say that really our focus should be on Ukraine. That's yeah. just I, that's just incredible to me. It, it, it would be as if you know, me as a, as a husband and father, if I told my wife that my most important priority is the condition of the woman down the street, her household, right. to make sure that she's fed and her children are fed while, you know, our family is starving and feeling insecure. So um, when, so when I hear people like Mitch McConnell and a lot of other, you know, congressional Republicans speak this way, again, to me, it just tells me that they don't really understand their top priority and are not as concerned with American interests as, as they should be. Right. Yeah. That's why America first is so important to me. When I hear mm. a politician say that or anyone say that, I'm paying attention. Do you really believe America mm. first? And you have to have that as one of your talking points or one of the things that you believe to even get my attention in right. the first place. I don't want someone that's paying attention to everything outside of America. America first, because that's where I live. Mm. That's where my children live. And that's what I want to make sure is great. Yeah. And, you know, if people would get offended when Trump would say, make America great again, and you would have a lot of people saying, when was it ever great? Where there was a time that I even remember that it was great. You could leave your doors unlocked. You mm. didn't have to worry about crime the way, you know, we do now. America was great and I think we can still have that if we put America first if we're yeah. gonna focus on everything else we're never gonna get there yeah. yeah I agree I mean some people are offended by that they think that that means that you lack empathy or compassion for other people but it really is a great metaphor to mm -hmm. talk about it like a family because countries really are like families mm -hmm. we care about our neighbors if our neighbor Correct. is in trouble mm -hmm. we obviously want to help them but not at the expense of my kids like if right. I told like if my husband told us okay we're going to let every person in from the neighborhood. We're not going to vet them. We're not going to look at their background. We have no idea what they're mm -hmm. bringing in our house. We are going to let them eat. We're going to give them all of the protection and the resources that's in our home. And not in addition to getting those things ourselves, right. but instead of mm -hmm. us, then mm -hmm. that, that would make him a bad husband. That would make him a bad father. That would make mm -hmm. him a bad provider. And in the same way, when you're putting other countries before your own country, that makes you a bad leader. That yeah. is actually lacking compassion. Sure. Some people just don't seem to understand that. No. I don't know. <laughs> right. Um, okay. I want to talk a little bit about, um, we were also talking about this before the camera started rolling. It will kind of go into this in general, but specifically in relation to Roe v. Wade and the abortion issue, which is obviously especially hot right now, something that people are really talking about. I read this article in the Washington Examiner. Uh, Big city teachers unions say Supreme Court draft overturning Roe v. Wade is... Racist. racist. Of course it's racist. <laughs> I didn't even see the article, but I knew I knew how <laughs> exactly you knew. knew how the joke so ended. this is what the Chicago Teachers Union said. The same forces that want to erase black history and black votes, what? Trample the rights of transgender students and our queer siblings. So again, they put it mm -hmm. all together like mm -hmm. we were talking about and build walls around our country, again, going back to what we were talking about, are continuing their attacks by threatening a woman's right to choose. Delano, can you tell me why these issues are always conflated? Like abortion and LGBTQ, they're seen as like racial justice issues. You What's know, going on there? I've been thinking about this because I, I like to name things. Right? I, I like to come That's up with good. Terms. We need people to name things. Um, I would call this chocolate-covered Marxism. Okay. Mm. So what, what I think <laughs> the left does, they understand that they're pushing a radical agenda. But they understand if they push it in a traditional way that a lot of um, their constituents would be resistant to it because their constituents don't want to see more um, cisgender heterosexual males telling people what to do. So they said, let's dip it in chocolate. Let's make black people the face of it. Um, and we will turn, for mm -hmm. instance, what used to be called gay rights, mm -hmm. which was basically a lot of middle class white men who wanted to access the privileges of middle class bourgeoisie you know normalcy be able to buy a house and get an education and, and 
have a job, have a, um, a partnership that's recognized by the state, pass on property. That has transformed into the LGBTQIA2 S plus mm-hmm. agenda, oh, that's impressive. which that now <laughs> I get a lot of uh, um, exercise on it. <laughs> but now if, if you notice every time the president mentions transgenderism, like on the transgender day of remembrance, he will always talk about the um, transgender uh, uh, black girls and, and women of color yeah. who are being assaulted and, and, you know, uh, victims of crime in the streets because this in effect is a black scene. So you, you inoculate yourself from charges of racism if you make every part of your agenda a racial justice issue. So same thing with abortion. Mm. Now they're saying that if black women aren't able to terminate their pregnancies, right, that this is a function of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. So we've come to the point where um, fewer black children being born is liberation and more black children being born if Roe v. Wade is overturned is, as I said, an aspect of white supremacy. And so this will continue. So it's the, the LGBT stuff, abortion, climate change, what they call climate change will be framed as um, the black folks who live in and around cities and the name New Orleans and other people who live you know, on the East Coast. They're the ones who will be most in danger from climate change. So that's why we need to take over one sixth of the economy and steer it in the right direction to avert this existential crisis, all yeah. while the Obamas still live in their waterfront, of course, their, their beachfront mansion. So, of course, so chocolate co- covered Marxism. That's what I'm going with. Okay, quick pause to tell you guys about my first sponsor for the day, and that is my Patriot Supply. All right, guys, we talk a lot about the unpredictable future. It is kind of scary to wonder what's going to happen with food shortages and with the insane rise in inflation. Are we even going to be able to afford the food that we're able to get a rise in fertilizer prices mean that there's also a food shortage? So that just means that you and your family need to be prepared. There's no reason to panic because it is better to be safe than sorry. And my Patriot Supply exists for that very reason. They've got emergency food kits filled with food that is actually good. It's actually nutritious. Plus, if you use my link, preparewithally.com, you get $150 off their three-month emergency food kits. Get one for every person in your family. You'll enjoy a wide variety of normal meals. It's not bunker food. It's actually good food, um, but it's food that you can stow away. You can feel comfortable knowing that at least your family will be taken care of. So save $150 by going to preparewithally.com. Go to preparewithally.com. Calm. I heard Janet Yellen. She's the Treasury Secretary. I don't know if you guys saw her exchange mm-hmm. with Senator Tim Scott. Mm-hmm. I don't think I have the clip because I forgot to ask for it. But she um, was saying, you know, Roe v. Wade being overturned or women not having enough access to abortion is going to negatively impact the labor participation rate. It's going Mm -hmm. to have a negative impact on the economy. And, you know, most of these women, she said, they're in poverty and they're black. Mm -hmm. And Tim Scott, what a person to say that to. Senator Scott said, well, I just think that as a black guy who was raised by a mother in abject poverty, I'm happy to be here as a United States senator. And that was just the perfect, simple response because it it, it, like also what's amazing about that statement is that she represents the very same side who called conservatives callous for bringing up the economy when it came to covid Mm. they called us grandma killers for Mm. that but now she's (laughs) saying so babies need to be placed on the altar of the economy which is also stupid because like you actually do economically speaking need more children and need more people to like replace the older generations for labor force participation. It's all crazy. What do you think about that, Shamika? What do you think about her response that black women need abortion in order to be successful? Allie, like 
Delano was saying, I think anytime they want to get black people involved or pull on our heartstrings, mm. they wrap anything in racism. Mm. When they were talking about illegal immigration, they brought in black people. They felt like we should be understanding for, for minorities. And I'm thinking, well, somebody floating in on an inner tube is certainly different than the, my ancestors that were brought here unwillingly, you know? Right. And when they want to talk about voter suppression, oh, black people, you know, this is going to take you back to Jim Crow. Mm. They're doing the same thing with mm. abortion. They always do that because black people fall for it so much. We are, you know, so compassionate. And we're so afraid. When I heard them say that they were going, you know, if they overturn Roe versus Wade, be careful. They can overturn civil rights. Right. They can, right. I said, oh, gosh, they're going to do the same thing that they've mm -hmm. done with everything mm -hmm. else. And listening to Janet, it's offensive to me because I'm a product of rape. Mm -hmm. My mother was raped at 14 by a complete stranger. Mm -hmm. I was born to her at 15. Mm -hmm. If she had the choice or if someone was forcing her mm. to have an abortion, I would not be here. So when they talk as if that is the only option for uh, black women or poor women, that's just simply not true. I was born to a 15 year old. She ha of course had to work hard to take care of me, but she did it and here I am. So it's possible. So when I hear people speak about that, you don't talk about the possibilities. Like like all you talk about is the negative aspect of it. And I am a prime example of the possibilities. Yeah. 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 So absolutely. It's personal to me. Mm. Right. <laughs> and they're, it, they're people, even if someone did grow up in exclusive hardship, even if a, a person was born into poverty and then they were homeless and never really did contribute anything to society, they were never productive, that's still a human being. Mm -hmm, and right. it seems to me like the pro-abortion side, like Janet Yellen, they simply forget about the humanity. Even if Tim Scott never became Senator Scott, right, it right. still would have been wrong to abort him. It Correct. still would not have been a good justification just because his mom is poor, because he's a human being. And it seems to me like the left forgets that and a lot of people fall for it even professing christians kind of fall for mm -hmm. the whole like abortion is compassionate abortion is racial justice thing yeah. it's bizarre to me <laughs> I, I i think it it underscores um and particularly for the left when you detach policy um and, I, and i'll say this as a christian when you detach policy from a sense of objective morality this is where you get to you get to the point where life is not does not have inherent value it has conditional value and one of those conditions is the economic security of the mother and another is whether the mother wants the child and if you have those two right then you've got a green light but if you don't if you're missing one of them then mm -hmm. it's well this is not you know it's not a good time for her she can pursue you know educational opportunities so when janet yellen speaks in 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 one sense she's actually being honest about how the left sees human life. Exactly. Um, she's reading from a feminist script that was written a long time ago that mm -hmm. says that the ultimate use of a woman's time and energy is in the labor force. Um, mm -hmm. That says that marriage and family are forces of oppression. Mm -hmm. Children are opportunity costs because look at how much more you could be doing with your life. Um, so it, it, I think you see all of those things coming together and to, to Shamika's point, they know exactly the buttons to push to um, inflame may not be the word, but, but to, to excite and flame the black community. This is what I call the Selma syndrome, where they take America's um, racial history, right? Which at times has been very ugly, so, mm -hmm. so we don't have to paper over that. But what they do, instead of saying, this is what happened then, right. and look how far we've come since then, they say, this is what is waiting at your door. So you need to give us the power to keep from going back into Jim Crow, to keep from Brown versus Board of Ed being reversed or Loving versus Virginia being reversed. Mm -hmm. um, and, they, and they know exactly the buttons to push. Um, and, and when they do it, that's how you get to your point, evangelicals, black and white, the ones who talk about racial justice, the ones who talk about social justice and racial disparities, who some of them have been against abortion for a long time, but because of the way it went about, of, of if Roe was overturned, because they will have to give some of that credit to the former president, to President mm -hmm. Trump, 
they want to get as far away from that as possible. So now the talking point is, well, you, if Rose overturned, you Christians better show that you're pro all of life from womb to tomb. Yeah. And you, we need bigger government. And, and, you know, the government is our dad and he needs to pay up. And, and I'm just like, no, no words of celebration, no thanking God for his grace yeah. in this particular area. But it's, it's so you see the secular left and the religious left. Right. Who, who they're shedding their skin of con- of theological conservatism mm-hmm. as we're, yeah. we're seeing that before our very eyes. I, I mean, there's some people and, I, and I'll, I'll end on this point. Um, a, a lot of some of your listeners may have heard of Jamar Tisby, um, mm-hmm. who's <laughs> deep in the anti-racism game, used to work with Ibram Kendi. I signed up for his newsletter because oh, I'm yeah. a glutton for punishment. I was about and, to um, say. <laughs> and. He said that him and one of his uh, co-hosts on his podcast, two self-identified Christian black men, mm-hmm. were talking about abortion. Mm-hmm. And if you just read it, you would never think that these were two Christian black men because they had all the talking points. We're men, so we shouldn't talk about this. Um, this is safe activism for white conservatives. White uh, Conservatives use Roe versus abortion. Um, uh, they talk about the disproportionate effect it has on black folks. And they use that against us. And at no point did he ever talk about the obligations that men, including black men, have to the mothers of their children um, and the children themselves. It's always about more government spending and m- more of what white people should be doing to help. Um, I'm assuming he thinks to help black folks. And yeah. you, you see all of that playing out, even in the words that Janet Yellen yeah. said to Tim Scott. Both of y'all are touching on kind of emotional manipulation that you think are used against black people Mm -hmm. to try to, I guess, just fundamentally get them to keep voting Democrat Mm -hmm. and to believe that, you know, their real enemy is white supremacists or white evangelicals. Mm. Um, Why do you think that is effective? Because I think it's about 92 percent of black Americans do vote Democrat. And we're even talking about people that maybe we would consider conservative Christians Mm. in some ways, at least as far as like sexuality and stuff goes, they still will vote Democrat. I mean, why, why do you think that is? Personally, for me, it's the way I was raised Mm. and not necessarily at no time did my family sit me down and say, Hey, you have to be a Democrat. Yeah. But I remember when Ronald Reagan won And I remember my family saying things like, oh, my God, this is the Antichrist because his name was Ronald Wilson Reagan. He he has six letters in each name. And so it's six, six, six. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. (laughs) Yes. And so I'm young, but I remember this. And I went to. That kind of stuff has been around for a long time. Because people on both sides still think that kind of thing now. (laughs) Yeah. And I went to an all black school so I can remember teachers Mm. just being you know saying pretty much this was horrible so very early on I formed white democrat good because they love Jimmy Carter Mm. white republican bad now this is me at six five five six years old Mm. being able to make that correlation just by what i'm hearing everyone say and then growing up in the black church we always had democrats to come during election time to speak in the church and this was just they were who you know we had our arms open to Mm. so i always thought democrat is for us and it wasn't until i got older actually when obama was in office because I was one of the people that voted for him because he was black. (laughs) So actually, when he was in office, I started seeing things that didn't line up. And it made me think this doesn't line up with what I actually believe. Like, what was it and what kind of gave you that revelation? Well, for one, he seemed to push a lot of the LGBTQ Mm. agenda. Mm -hmm. And for me, that didn't line up with Christian values. Mm. Uh, And I was raised in the church. So I'm like, wait a minute, that's not looking right. And I saw a lot of race and I kind of got caught up in it a little bit, just feeling like, oh, I'm black. So I'm automatically oppressed. It didn't matter that I was living in a four bedroom, three bathroom (laughs) house. (laughs) It didn't matter that we had two Mercedes and a Cadillac Mm. in the driveway. Mm. I was I'm oppressed because I'm black. What do you mean? Mm. And so 
it just and had that message that message of oppression do you feel like that was indoctrinated indoctrinated in you at a young age or do you think that obama kind of exacerbated that or made you feel that way i think he made me see that i was wrong about it mm. but i do think oh. that i was raised again nobody sat me down but just being observant and listening to people i i think i felt okay we're less than and then when obama just began when he was in office a lot of things began to come to light and i'm like that makes absolutely no sense. Yeah. It yeah. does not line up. And so when people ask me what made me become conservative or why do I identify with conservatism, it wasn't really just like a certain light bulb that came on or a decision. I think I decided what I'm voting for does not line up with what I actually believe, mm. what I always have believed. Yeah. I think most black people are conservative. I think they just vote wrong. And thankfully, I began to see the light around the time when Obama was in office. And I'm like, what am I doing? Yeah. So 2016, I knew for sure I wasn't voting for Hillary because absolutely not. Yeah, I wasn't completely sold on Trump because at this point, I'm going through the whole what's wrong with me that mm -hmm. I hear him, I understand what he's saying, I like and I agree. Yeah, We're, They're telling me this man is racist, he's misogynist, but I'm a black woman hmm. and I like him. Something's wrong with me. Yeah, <laughs> so, right. So, you know, it was just kind of, you know, a, a gradual awakening for me. And I do think it started during Obama's term, um, yeah. his hmm. terms in presidency. All right, guys, Father's Day is coming up. Memorial Day is coming up. We got all kinds of reasons to grill out this summer. And so you need to make sure that you've got high quality meat, high quality burgers. You may as well order them from good ranchers because all of their meat is from American farms, American ranchers. Plus their price is really good. Their quality is amazing. This would work as a really good gift maybe for your husband or for your dad. You can buy them a box of good ranchers meat or you can buy them a subscription even better. Um, the great thing is, is that not only with my link do you get $25 ev off every box uh, for the life of your subscription if you subscribe, also, when you subscribe, the price that you pay, you'll stay locked into that price. So even with inflation and the rising cost of meat everywhere else, you're not going to have to worry about that with Good Ranchers. Whatever price you pay today will be the price that you pay for life. So go to GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. Use promo code Allie at checkout. And when you do, you will grab two pounds of free American Wagyu burgers with your order. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Allie, code Allie, GoodRanchers.com slash Allie. I think um, part of what is going on and I don't I don't know when this change happened is that um blackness however people sort of define it which historically has been you know about skin color and phenotype and what people look like eventually morphed into a political identity mm -hmm. and the left is big on political identities mm -hmm. right so when people say identity politics that's part of what they're talking about um so I think it really, what really brought it out was, you know, the infamous when Biden said, if you don't know if you're voting for me or the other guy, then you ain't black. And there were some people, one of them being Nicole Hannah Jones, who said, let's not, she tweeted and deleted, let's not act as if we don't know the difference between racial blackness and political blackness. Mm. Um, and even though she was criticized for it, I think her assessment of what actually is is, is accurate and I think yeah. that's how a lot of people and a lot of black folks look at it it's like if you vote for a republican if i go in the barbershop and i and i say hey guys i'm a republican now they already call me a republican by the way <laughs> um and i say hey guys I'm, an, I'm a republican somebody is either going to say or think oh, this guy's a sellout mm -hmm. now they'll lie to you and say oh it's about trump but it's not about trump because they they said the same thing yeah. about bush Ronald about Reagan. McCain, right. about Reagan. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's not really about Trump, but 
it's the fusion of those two things that I think is the big problem. Actually, my most recent column for The Blaze is entitled uh, The President's Right. I ain't Biden black. And I go into talking about political blackness, which in the spirit of um, charity and attribution, I call Biden blackness. That's my new term for it. And I say what it is, is the same thing we were talking about before, how um, voting preferences get turned into a racial identity and how the left's agenda gets wrapped in, you know, um, racial justice terms. And as long as that remains the case, as long as the average black person feels like voting for Democrats, and particularly in national elections, is the black thing to do, it's going to be hard to move people. And then part of it is just, in general, the status quo is, is what it is, right? So that, that level of inertia, I, I've heard you say before, like, um, I'm paraphrasing, so forgive me if I get it wrong, <laughs> but it's like a dead fish can just sort of sit on the water, mm -hmm. but I think the salmon has to swim upstream. So it takes a lot mm -hmm. more energy to go against the current than yeah. it does to stay with the status quo. And I think that that, that inertia, that political inertia has set in over the course of decades. Um, and it's hard to move people. And going back to what I was saying, in 2020, when the article started to come out that a, a small subset of black men were moving towards Trump after four years of being told he's racist, then you see what the left did. Mm. They got Maxine Waters, they got Jim Clyburn. Um, I feel sorry for these people. These, these black men owe their mothers an apology. They got the academics. <laughs> they got the pundits to say that um, black women, uh, black men vote for Trump because they hate black women or mm. because they want to be like white men. All of those things are meant to keep people in line. Yeah. And unfortunately, um, we're at a point, and we've been here for a while, but um, within black America, quote unquote, you can be anything you want to be. You can rap about selling drugs, mm -hmm. shooting people. You can be, um, uh, you can be a Cardi B wannabe. Um, you can do all sorts of things, except be a conservative out loud and proud. Yeah. Right. And if you are, then you will get smacked on the wrist and told either to get back in line or get out of the community. So that, that's one border wall that the left yeah. is actually good with. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how they police the culture. And they say, we'll use shame. Now we won't shame you for doing black, white, Chinese, or candy stripe. Right. We won't shame you for doing all sorts of crazy stuff, right? But if you say you're gonna vote for a Republican. <laughs> right, that's where we draw the line. <laughs> yeah, you're out of here. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And it's not just emotional manipulation of black Americans, but there's a lot of emotional manipulation towards white people mm -hmm. and especially white Christians as well that we're not allowed to talk about certain things or we're not allowed to think about certain things or bring certain things up. And I think that is, that's also part of the like the bullying and the intimidation, this narrative that the oppression of black Americans and the reason for all of the disparities, whether they're economic disparities, graduation disparities, crime disparities, abortion disparities, that they're all because of like the oppression of white people and really mm -hmm. white Republicans or like white Christian Republicans somehow. Yeah. And it really is kind of like the 1619 narrative mm. that every disparity goes all the way back to 1619 when the statistics just don't show that. Like the breakdown of both the black and the white family really started in the 1960s. 60s, yeah. The rise in incarceration and crime started before the war on drugs. It started in the 1960s. It really started with the welfare state, that not just like the black family and black America, but but also white America in a lot of ways was negatively impacted and broken by that. It goes back to these progressive democratic policies that they are, these policies are actually to blame for a lot of the disparities that we're seeing today. But if you bring that up yeah. or you bring up that, hey, like maybe these behaviors or these values in any community mm -hmm. would not produce good mm -hmm. results. Mm -hmm. And then of course, like I definitely am told that I can't say that or I'm racist. For example, we <laughs> talked about the other day, we were talking about the abortion issue. Something that you hear a lot is that black women are more likely to die mm -hmm. in childbirth, um, which is actually true, but there's a lot that is covered up there. But then right. I was digging into the numbers and I actually found that the number one cause of um, maternal mortality for all races, but disproportionately black women is actually homicide. Homicide, yeah. homicide by their domestic partners. Mm. And black women are like eight times more likely than a woman of any other race to be killed while they're pregnant or postpartum. Mm -hmm. But again, 
I bring that up, I get a million messages saying, how dare you bring that up? We're working on this. You just don't know about it. Right. And that's our job. I'm like, are you? Because I never hear about it. So yeah, anyway, there's just a lot of manipulation and intimidation. I feel like we feel like we can't have open, frank conversations about it. Right. And when you talk about the maternal health of black women, it would always stump me like, well, my great grandma had this many. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you look around and you see people would have nine and 10 kids. And I'm like, where well, they weren't dying. So that's what kind of made me say something's not right about this. It's not simply because they because they're black that they're dying. There has to be something else. And a lot of people just won't do that extra research. They'll hear, oh, it's not good for black women to have children. Okay. And they'll just stop at that. But common sense would say there has to be something deeper than just skin color. Look into it. And that's what I wish people would do more of is to stop not not stop at skin color yeah. and actually look into it. Yeah. Cause it doesn't make sense. When you think about just your family having as many kids as they did in those times early. Mm. They would get started very early and they would be fine. You know, drop a baby and go back to work <laughs> in the field. So, you know. And drop another one 18 months later. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it yeah. has to be something different. And so I want people to start doing a little more research and, and stop stopping at skin color. Yeah. Well, that would stop us from, it also stops us from actually finding solutions to those things. Because if there is a reason that black women are dying at a higher rate in the hospitals, and if we're only assuming that it's racism, well, what if it's something else? Right. Like, what yeah. if it's hypertension or what if it's heart disease, which is more prevalent, which actually that is the answer that's mm-hmm. more prevalent amongst, um, among African-American women. But if we're not allowed to say that because it's racist, well, then people are going to continue to die. Right. Yeah. So it's almost like the solution, especially with Black Lives Matter and stuff, is not actually to save black Right. No, it's not because Black Lives Matter is more about um, white people, what white people think, say and do. And, and this is the entire racial justice scam is all about this. Right. It's not about um, black lives and prioritizing the needs of black people. It's about punishing white people for what we believe their ancestors did, you know, hundreds of years ago. Mm-hmm. And those two things are not the same thing. Being pro-black and anti-white are not the same thing, obviously. Um but yeah, even as you talked about maternal mortality, I, I've seen you know some of the research. What people often don't realize is that Hispanic women have lower maternal mortality rates than white women, even though they access prenatal care less than white women. Mm-hmm. Um, so the, the the straightforward racial narrative doesn't doesn't mm-hmm. really hold. Um, I, I do think a lot of it. Uh, I think some of it is hereditary because obviously if you're predisposed to certain um, um, chronic diseases. That can make pregnancy more difficult. Um, I don't doubt that some of it is differences in care. Um, But one thing that people don't really talk about, and this gets to part of what you were saying in terms of um, homicide being the number one issue, is when, when, when you have a breakdown in the order in terms of family formation, when marriage disappears and you're in a perpetual state of co parenting from conception through child rearing that introduces a level of stress into a relationship that I cannot believe is good for women right mm. I know I was on my best behavior when my wife was pregnant <laughs> with all of our kids and I told her I said you were, you were, you're at your most pleasant when you were when when you were pregnant <laughs> she was like I know and that is true but um <laughs> but I was very cognizant I didn't want to do anything to stress her out mm-hmm. and imagine being in a in a situation where you're not married to the um to, to the father of your child, right? Where he has not made any lifelong commitment to you mm-hmm. or your kids. And if you are managing relationships with other fathers of your children, all of those things are stressors. When you're calling him and saying, hey, I have an um, ultrasound appointment today. Can you make it? And he's like, I'm not, I don't want to be, you, you take care of it yourself. Right. You expect it to remain calm after that. So yeah. I, I never even see that part of it come in because whenever it deals with disparities, racial disparities, any issue having to deal with what black people can actually control gets taken off the table. Mm-hmm. It's always yeah. structural this, systemic this. Um, so I think that's one big issue. I, I want to, you, you brought up something in terms of um, the guilt trip that's laid at the feet of white evangelicals. I don't believe any white person, certainly not any white Christian, owes me anything other than the love that the Bible says I'm owed as a fellow human being Mm -hmm. and brother in Christ. That's it. 
And in fact, what they're doing, both within the church and outside of the church, is they're robbing me. They're robbing me of my agency. They're robbing my children of their agency when they say the key to Delano's children growing up and flourishing, you know they love that word, huh. is for me, white guy, to be a better person, to make better decisions, to spend my money in certain ways, to send my kids to certain schools. It's not about him. It's not about what he does. It's not about him and his wife, the household that they create. It's not about their family culture. It's not about their values. It's about mine. And that level of narcissism mm -hmm. is, is robbery. Mm. And in the same way that Congress actually has laws against stolen valor for people who say that they were in the military and they were, you know, I was, I, I won the ba battle of Pyongyang and, and all you <laughs> did, you were a reservist for four years right. stateside. But to me, this is stolen honor. Mm. And I, and I, it really, I, I, it's the hardest thing for me to control when I write or when I'm on social media, which I probably should not be on as much as I am, is to not just go completely crazy on these yeah. people because I, I, I want their image bearers. But when, when a man comes to steal something from me that belongs to me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's patronizing. It is. It is. And, yeah. and, and I know that that's what they're doing to my kids. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and I resent that. And I'm, I'm trying to ask God to work on my heart yeah. <laughs> because yeah. of that. But, but, but really, but seriously. So I, I, I just want, whether it's white person, Asian, Hispanic, black, to again, just give me what I'm owed. That's love. Yeah. Self -res that's respect, right? Dignity. Dignity. Yeah. And, I, and I'll do the same for you. And we can live harmoniously in this world. But if you come to me and tell me, you know, hey, sit down there, boy. I, I, I got I this. I got this for I'll you. I'll take care yeah, of this. Don't worry. No, you are yeah. then, best. Then, no, then we don't have yes, problems. Yes, you are. Yeah. Then, right, right, right. Yeah. Shh, shh. yeah. Be quiet. Yeah. You're oppressed. I'm, I'm working on it. Right. Then, then we're going to have problems. That white yeah. savior complex. Yes. All right, third sponsor for the day is an incredible sponsor, and that is Hunter Douglas. They've got innovative window shade designs, gorgeous fabrics, control systems that are so advanced they can be scheduled to automatically adjust to their optimal position throughout the day. They diffuse harsh sunlight and cast a beautiful glow across the room. You are able to enjoy the view outside while you're sitting inside while still protecting your privacy. One of the best parts, I think, is that they offer superior insulation, and so that keeps you warmer in the winter, cooler in the summer, lowers your utility bills. Plus, they've got that power view technology so that your shades can be set to automatically reposition throughout the day for the perfect balance of light, privacy, and insulation morning, noon, and night. So check out Hunter Douglas. Enjoy greater convenience, enhanced style, and increased comfort in your home throughout the day. Go to hunterdouglas.com slash Allie today for your free style get smarter design guide with fresh takes, creative of ideas and smart solutions for dressing your windows. That's hunterdouglas.com slash Allie for your free design guide. Hunterdouglas.com slash Allie. Listening to you say that, Delano, it makes me think about how every year at Christmas you have a lot of black people saying, mm -hmm. I'm not going to let my child think that, <laughs> you know, and I don't want to say it. I don't know how many kids watch the right. show. Right, but real. If, you, white man right. Yeah, if you really believe that, then why the rest of the year mm. do you wait for Ooh. this white person to come, to come in mm. and save you and take the credit for mm. the hard work that you need to do? So the you're saying that at Christmas, black people say, oh, I don't want my kids to think some white man is giving them gifts. Yeah, so I've seen it. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah but so. it's like then the rest of the year, that's what you're waiting on. Mm. Yeah, you're waiting Joe on Biden. the white man to come and give you a gift. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, that's, that's good. a really yeah. good point. That's, good. that's, that's good. a good point. You know, I see that like from the pulpit as well. Like there are two different messages that kind of social justice pastors preach to their white congregants versus their black congregants. Mm -hmm. Their white congregants is like, oh, you have collective repentance mm -hmm. to do. You have collective, you know, um, grief and reparations mm -hmm. to pay and you need to yeah, divest of your privilege, your whiteness and stuff and basically tell black people like you have only exclusively been sinned against in all of your problems. Even the sin struggles that you have are probably a result of some kind of systemic oppression. Mm -hmm. Well, 
that's leading people straight to hell. Like mm. if you think that your that your problem isn't that you're separated from God without Christ, and you think all the problems are really because of white people or really because of one system, I mean, you can critical race theory yourself straight into Hades that mm. way. Like both need the gospel. Both are equally dead in sin apart from Christ. Both need Christ in order um, to be saved. And so it actually is, it's a robbing. It's a robbing for pastors to do that, to preach the gospel of repentance to one side because of their skin color, because they can handle it but not to black people because they can't. Yeah. I mean, you that means you don't care about them. You don't love them. You don't care about their soul. You don't care if they go right. to hell. Yeah. Right. Because you would rather feel better about yourself and them feel maybe better about themselves mm. um, than preach the gospel, which is that we are all Correct. equally dead in sin. Correct. Right. And, and they, uh, no, go I'm ahead, sorry. go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to say, it seems that they get mad because I don't hate white people. Right. And it's like, am I supposed to? Like where am, where is it written that I'm supposed to hate white people? And if you're a Christian, then you would know that's absolutely evil, right. you know, to start with. And so I now look at it like when people get mad or they want to say I'm a coon or Aunt Tom. Mm. It's just funny to me because I'm like, you're mad that I'm not walking around angry every single day. Mm. I thought that's where we were. But that's what we were striving to be was happy and getting along with mm-hmm. each other and loving our fellow man. But now you're telling me that I'm wrong because I don't walk around hating white people every day. Yeah. It's crazy to me. And I don't even understand how any preacher could stand in the pulpit and and justify preaching a message that would cause people to go out and hate someone because of their skin color. Like, how can you do that and call yourself a Christian sure. or yeah. a pastor? You know, you should just like that's just wrong to me. Yeah. I mean, it's bad ethics and it's bad Bible. I right. Mean, I, I'm thinking of Ezekiel 18 where. I mean, prophet. It, it's it's a it's a long treatise in terms of um, the son not being responsible for the sins of the father, and mm. the father not responsible for the sins of the son. And I mean, right. it's specific. It talks about oppression and, and murder and so on and so forth. And again, it's it's so patronizing because what ends up happening is that white people, both in and outside the church, who think this way, believe that they are more responsible for the actions of their great grandfathers than I am for the actions of my son. Mm. And that doesn't make any sense because right. I'm raising my son. Right, mm. your great granddad is gone. You gone. you don't even know what his name is. Right. Yeah. Um, and and as I said, that that type of thing is patronizing. But the other thing, and I'm sure you've seen this, Ali, is that this type of uh, oppression-based theology within the church, the evangelical, you know, theologically conservative, quote unquote, church, also is what silences um, women who are either feminist light or reject complementarianism. <laughs> this is why they can't speak on anything having to do with transgenderism because that would put them in the oppression driver's seat and they don't want to do that. Yeah. And this is why they've been so quiet on the issue of abortion. Mm-hmm. Because again, the more they speak out publicly on abortion, particularly in light of this, the leak around Roe, the more they get grouped in with the you know, the hands made, the handmade tales, right. Republican, <laughs> Trump, ultra MAGA crowd who they want to avoid at all costs. So um, one of my earlier columns, which I, this is one of my favorite titles or concepts, is that these women, right, both in and outside the church, who have spent their entire lives fighting for the rights of women and saying women have been oppressed and liberation, have finally found a group of men that they can submit to. Yeah. And and certainly on the trans issue, and that's why you said they they will not touch that. They're totally submitting to men who call themselves women. For sure, they won't touch that with a ten foot pole. Um, And if they do, they want to steer it back to a conversation about you know systemic oppression, Mm -hmm. whether of black folks or of women. But they can't um, hit these issues head on. And in the same way you talked about you know that that theoretical pastor, um, their theology is is boxed off. Because they can only go in a certain direction on certain issues. And anything else that, again, would make them play the role of oppressor, mm. they won't touch it. Right. Yeah. I've noticed with a lot of women who I know to be pro-life, these are big Christian women influencers I'm thinking of on Instagram. And they are believers. I'm not mm. questioning that. And they're probably conservative in most of their theology and maybe a lot of their politics. But 
they're these this group that I'm thinking of is not so scared of being like labeled MAGA as they simply are hurting their friends' feelings, mm. who has a different opinion than them, or like just getting criticism or getting comments. And so I have seen a couple. There are a couple of people that I'm thinking of that I'm like, oh, she said something about Roe. That's good. That's good. But what I do notice, and I'm not, I don't want to criticize because I'm like, you know what? You put it out there. Good. I know that was hard for you. I know that you're worried about getting criticism. The thing that I see though, is that it's so different from how they respond when like police brutality Correct. happens or mm-hmm. alleged police Correct. brutality, even Correct. if they don't have the whole story. Like with the abortion thing, the post that I'm seeing from this crowd, they are so shrouded in caveats, mm. so much explanation, <laughs> so much nuance. Like, I know this is a hot topic. I know this is gonna mm-hmm. hurt some people's right. feelings. I know that this is complicated. I know that's complex, but me personally, I <laughs> would rather <Yeah>. not <laughs> right. kill right. babies, but that's just me. Right. Like, but then if it came to like, oh, that story, which ended up being bogus about the border patrol, like whipping, whipping my, it, it's yeah. like, this definitely happened. This right. is racism. Mm-hmm. And they don't, they don't even care. And it's because it's not really about justice. It's about what or is the secular progressive side going to applaud? Mm-hmm. And what are they going to jeer at? They don't want to take the jeering. They really want Correct. to be liked by both camps so much. Correct. They think that if they're winsome enough, if they're nice enough, if they're trendy enough, if they give just an inch on some of like the more secular stuff, then you know, they won't be criticized and they'll just be liked by everyone. Yeah, right. But Stephen was full of grace and truth and he was stoned to death. Stone. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It makes me feel like they don't believe this one simple little thing. If God be for me, who can Mm. be against me? Mm. You know, if you really truly believe that, you don't really worry about who's going to be angry with what with, with what you have to say if you know you're standing on the side of truth. Mm. And that's the way it is for me. And I get so critical a lot of times of Christians. I am a former, mm. and I always say former, mm. ordained minister because it makes me so angry when I see people that profess to be Christians be so weak and be so timid and not stand up for what they know is right. If God be for you, who can be against you? Mm. It doesn't matter. When I say something and I really feel like I'm standing in truth and I really feel like I'm standing on God's side, it doesn't matter the hateful comments that I get. Mm. It doesn't matter how many people want to jump in my inbox and say something mean. It doesn't matter if my neighbor gives me a weird look when I come (laughs) out of the house. You know, I'm like, I'm on the side of truth. And that's all that really matters to me. And I think a lot of people have really gotten away from that and they forget about that. And so they are worried about what someone else is going to think and how they feel about them. And I just don't care because I'm going to hold him at his word, Mm. period. You know, if Mm. God said it, then it has to be true. So you're going to make sure I have a place to stay. You're going to make sure I have food to eat and to be able to feed my children. And I'm going to be okay. And I have to stand on that and believe that because look at what's going on around us. I can't afford financially or spiritually to be weak and not do anything. I can't afford to. All right, let me tell you guys about one of my favorite companies and that is Naturally It's Clean. So as moms, we're cleaning all the time, but we want to make sure that the... Uh, cleaning substances that we are using are as safe as possible for our kids, for our pets, and for ourselves. But we also want to make sure that the cleaning products that we are using are actually effective. None of that stuff that claims to be natural and cleans your kitchen, but afterwards you look at your kitchen and you're like, it looks like I didn't do anything. No, you want stuff that is actually effective, but is as safe as possible. And that is why we use in our home, Naturally It's Clean. You can get a hospital grade cleaning product that will not leave harmful chemicals on all of your surfaces. Um, they have these, uh, the, their technology, their their secret sauce is plant-based enzymes, nature solution to cleaning. And when I say powerful, I am talking about hospital grade enzyme cleaning power. Naturally It's Clean has safer chemistry formulas to clean every area of your home from the bathroom to your hardwood floors to your kitchen, also your furniture and your carpets. All of their products are manufactured right here in the USA. They offer free two-day shipping direct to your door. 
Those of you who have been using Naturally It's Clean, you've messaged me, you've told me that you absolutely love it. I love to hear it. So try these amazing products for yourself if you haven't already. Right now, relatable listeners can get their hands on the Naturally It's Clean Alley's Essential Starter Kit, stocked with four great products for 15% off. Simply visit naturallyitsclean.com slash Alley. Use promo code Alley. Try out these incredible cleaning products in your home today for 15% off. Naturallyitsclean.com slash Alley. Code Alley. That's naturallyitsclean.com slash Alley. I think you hit on an excellent, both of you hit on an excellent point, um, which is both the, primarily theological, but also bleeds into p- political and cultural as well, which is what people need today um, is not better talking points. We need more people with some steel in the spine mm-hmm. because it's, as you said, I, and I've seen that dynamic too. There is no nuance or grace or understanding for the alleged racist. Mm-hmm. People have no problem going at them with the f- a th- the fury of a thousand suns. Alleged being the key word there. Correct. <laughs> um, but when it comes to issues, again, like abortion or even people who deny, you know, Genesis 127, wh- whether that's on abortion or transgenderism. Or male and female, yeah. Right. Then it's a, the argument suffers a death of a thousand caveats. Yeah. Um, and, and I think... You know, to, to Shamika's point, for people who believe that they have the truth and are standing on God's truth, to be so timid and weak and mealy mouth mm-hmm. is is to me that that is is it seems like it would be sinful because God is saying, "I have said this, right? Yeah. If you say you believe me, trust my words. Don't trust your own understanding." But we say, "No, God." And part of it is because many conservatives, their their highest um, uh, desire is the respectability of the left. Mm-hmm. And this is why um, when they get in left-leaning platforms, whether it's the Atlantic or New York Times, they always, at best, they'll tickle to the left you're and then they'll about, punch. You're talking about Christians. Cr- Christians, Christians, correct, correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll tickle to the left and then they'll punch to the right. But even some so non-Christian... True. Gosh, I can think of a thousand yeah, people we that can that rattle describes. Off names. So true. But, but even non-Christians, right? Even some, you know, congressional Republicans will, are... are easy, it's easy for them to criticize the ultra-maga crowd, which I heard a couple ultra-maga. I said, you know what? I just learned right. that <laughs> phrase the other day. <laughs> I don't ultra-maga even... don't sound too bad. <laughs> right. But um, it's easy for them to criticize those people. It's a lot harder when they're doing an op-ed in the New York Times or the Atlantic to, to speak truth as it relates to sex and gender um, because they don't want to be criticized by the left. And I think once you realize that the left uses that fear of being shamed to control us in the same way we talked about how they use certain tools to control black voters. Once you throw that off and you say, you know what, I don't care what you think. Yeah. I'm not going to be let somebody who believes that Rachel Levine is a man and Leah Thomas is a man uh, uh, tell me what I should think or or dictate morals to me. I'm not going to let somebody who thinks that a child should and could be aborted up even to the point where their their mother's dilating. Right. And you call you call that a reproductive justice and you use the prospect of rape to m- manipulate me emotionally all while you would fight for the rapist to get off death row. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Under yeah they'd criminal fight justice. For them to get out of jail. Mm-hmm. Under the guise of criminal justice. Mm-hmm. I'm not right. letting people like that make me feel bad about standing on God's truth. So you can call me whatever you want. Mm-hmm. You can say whatever you want, whatever mm-hmm. bad names. As you said, we all get it the coon right. and the tom and the, the dancing raccoon. Right. Who cares? Next, yeah. get another argument. Yep. Yeah. And keep moving forward. So that's, that's what I would say. And I think our silence over the years, that's why we're here. Correct. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people were silent when I think it was the baker didn't want to make the mm-hmm. cake for mm-hmm. the two. A lot of people were silent. And now we wonder why we have kids transitioning mm-hmm. at eight years old. Mm-hmm. We were silent then when we should have been speaking Speak up and yep. when we should have been loud. So now is not the time to be quiet. We've been quiet for too long. Correct. That's the problem. That's why we're here now. That's why we look like we're living in 
in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. That's why we look like we we don't know if we're coming or going because we have been quiet for way, way too, too long. long. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And for the Christians who think, oh, well, I don't want to wait into politics. These are culture war issues. It's too divisive. Look, these are Genesis 1 issues. OK, right. these are fundamentally theological and theologically fundamental issues. They've become political. The world will tell you they're political. The world will tell you these are culture war issues. But this really goes back. Abortion, gender, sexuality, marriage, family, the the big ones that are controversial that a lot of Christians don't want to talk about because mm-hmm. they don't want to be unloving. That goes back to the first chapter of the Bible. Mm-hmm. So you're telling me as a Christian, you can't even defend what the first chapter mm. of right. the Bible says? <laughs> no, this is theological for us. People can call it political. It bleeds right. into the political and cultural realm, but it's downstream from what we believe about God. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned, you know, you think it's sim- sinful, the death by a thousand caveats, which I love. I'm definitely going to use that. But you question whether it's sinful. I think it is because when people try to soften what God's word says Mm. about sex or sexuality, gender, abortion, all that stuff, they're essentially saying that they are more loving than God. Mm. That how God says something is not loving enough. It's not nice enough. Mm -hmm. It's not kind enough. And someone who thinks that they should soften what the Bible says to appeal to the world you're essentially making yourself God. Yes. You're mm-hmm. essentially saying, well, yeah, God said that, but let me let God off the hook right, there. He right, didn't really right. mean that. Right. I know he said that, but let me tell you the culturally relevant, nicer <laughs> nicer way to put that. You are saying that you are kinder than God. You can't be kinder than God. Right. God is love for Sean 1, 9. That means, and we're not. So everything that he says and does, he does out of love. The most loving thing that we can do is agree with him. And gosh, why wouldn't we have the courage to be yeah. loving? Yeah. Right. You know? That's the same way it is for the white savior complex when the white people feel like they need to fix what's going on with black people because we're so oppressed. They feel like, okay, let me come in with my white skin, ride in on my white horse Mm. to fix what's going on. Well, I don't need you to because someone rode in on a donkey Mm. and it's been done already. You know, so (laughs) I get so mad when I see people not really, you know, uh, speaking up and speaking out. And I'm like, can y'all come on? Y'all gonna make me put my collar back on and I really don't want to. <laughs> I need everybody to join hands and, you know, yeah. really speak out against these things that we yeah. know are just absolute error. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a good place to end. Thank yeah. you so much for you. giving the encouragement at the end, just like the call to courage. We say a lot that courage begets courage. Yes. So seeing someone stand up, take the arrows from the world and being willing to say, you know, Rather than looking at that person and saying, oh, I'm glad that's not me standing up and saying, you know, what? I'll take those arrows too. whatever. Yeah. I believe that, too. I'm going to take that courage. It's worth it, not just for us, but gosh, for our kids, too, for yes. future generations. Yes. At the very least, we want to be able to say that we stood up when it counted. One day Jesus will come back. Every knee will bow. Every tongue Don't will confess. confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That will be the only day that, you know, perfect justice and righteousness reigns. But until then, we are called to be obedient. And that's what he gives us the strength to do. Um, so thank you guys for thank doing you. that and Thanks for giving for us an example us. in that. I really appreciate it. Cool.